of you all, I promise I, I am a faculty. For some of you, you saw me at another presentation if you're a graduate assistant, right? I, re I recognize some of the faces. But I am um, Dr. Jelena Alston. I proudly serve as the coordinator for the Master of Science in Adult Education program here at North Carolina a and um, I also am a committee member for the um, IRB committee here for the university. Um, and then lastly, I am the co-editor-in-chief for Adult Learning, which is a top-tier peer-reviewed journal in the field of adult education. And then I'm going to let my wonderful colleague introduce herself. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Sharita Mathis Lawson. I am a newly minted PhD here from North Carolina A&T State University. I completed my degree in May in leadership studies, so I'm very, very new to the process, um, familiar with the process. It's fresh on my mind, just went through it. Um, Dr. Austin was also one of my committee members. I'm an adjunct instructor here at North Carolina a t as well as over at Bennett College and the College of Education. Um, I have a couple publications in process, been doing a lot of national as well as local um, engagements and conferences. So this is where I'm, we're here and happy to share what I learned just recently through the process as well as um, working. I'm also on the dissertation committee. I got my first committee. So I'm very, very excited. <coughs> All right, so the process. When we were asked to talk about this a couple weeks ago over in the Leadership Studies Department, and I started thinking about this process was so fresh, and they said, we want you to tell people about the process of getting your degree. And I found this one slide, and I think this just sums it all up. This is how you get your PhD or your thesis. Okay. Um, this is kind of the, the process from... <laughs> Uh, not just from a technical completing this checkbox this, but this process I want you to think about is something that you're going to do externally but also internally as well because it is you as a person that's completing this. So it's just about, it's just as much about you and the person and the lessons that you learn about yourself. I know contrary to people's belief, this is not about how smart you are. This is not about who has the most information, who had the highest SAT scores, who scored the highest on the comps. It's not about any of that. <coughs> this comes down to lots of internal drive, commitment, dedication, focus, and persistence. And sacrifice. And sacrifice. All right. So this was kind of how my journey, if I had to sum it up into a visual, this was kind of <laughs> what I went through. The process was a little kind of everywhere. Although there was a process, there wasn't a process. And there was a process, but then sometimes there was not a process. And so today what we're going to do is go through the university's process. Again, I recognize that there are individuals here from lots of different programs. So there may be some variations to some of the things that we talk about by the program. But most of this is standard. We're going to show you some information from the graduate school, but there may also be some things that's tailored specifically in your department that you would need to insert, okay? And the one thing I did not mention is, um, so yes, my discipline now is adult education, but I am a classically trained microbiologist. For years I did research, um, particularly with wound therapy um, and, and uh looking at electromagnetic pulses and how that penetrates cell wall for antibacterial, uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. Um, so I understand both sides, the quantitative as well as the qualitative. I was a wet bench lab person, wore the bunny suit, worked in the BSL level four, so I understand IRB, IACUC, as well as IBC. Um, so I don't want you all to think that because we are in the social sciences that we cannot give you a little bit of insight for the more traditional heart sciences or biological life sciences, okay? All right, so we're going to fast forward in the process and pretend as though you've already completed the course requirement, your core courses. You've already taken a comp exam that was required, oral, written, whatever that was for you. And let's say we're at the point in this process, in the stage where you're going to pick your committee, okay? The committee is like your team. And your team has some very important members. There's some players that you're going to put on the team. Some of them you choose. One of them you do not get to choose. But the most important person that you pick is the chair. This is your right hand, your confidant. This is your advocate. They're your mentor. They become everything and all things to you during this process. So that's committee member number one. 
there's different options in your um, program for who that could be. Maybe you've taken a course with someone that you really love their style. Maybe there's someone whose research you think aligns with your research interests, who has a background. Maybe their methods for studying aligns with the type of methodology that you want to use. But making a decision about key person number one is very, very important. Then we have committee members number two. I call them one, two, and three, which are the other committee members outside of the chair. Okay? Those three, sometimes you'll get advice from your chair as to who those other three individuals may be, or sometimes they're just people that you decide to pick. Here at North Carolina a and you do have the option of selecting one person who is not on faculty or who does not work here at the university, and that's the outside person. If you do decide to pick an outside person, there is a process that they have to go through. They must get an approval. You can't just select them and say, oh, I'm going to pick Dr. So-and-so from an undergraduate program in Michigan. There are certain requirements that the graduate school has that that individual has to be a graduate level um, faculty person. Okay, so you might need to be very mindful of that and look at those policies if you pick an off-campus person. Okay? And always um, utilize Dr. Bigsby and his colleagues in the graduate school. If you have any questions about the process, that's the first go-to. They have a graduate catalog that lays out policies and procedures that you are to follow with specific regard to the thesis and dissertation process, your advisory committee makeup, the rules and regulations, timelines, etc. So before you even get to the committee, make sure that you review that document. And don't wait until you get to that process. You want to go ahead and start looking at that now and familiarize yourself with the laws of the land as far as you um, developing your proposal and, and really thinking about your committee. And which is that document called? The Catalog. graduate catalog. Graduate catalog. Do you want to speak to that, Dr. Bigsby, on the website where they mm -hmm. can find it? Sure. Um, if you go to the main website of the Graduate College, and everybody should be familiar with the Graduate College website, ncat.edu slash TGC, the Graduate College, TGC. And right on the front page, uh, on the left-hand side, there's a link for the, grad, the graduate catalog. Okay. And the graduate catalog is yeah, a comprehensive uh, set of policies and procedures. Okay. All right. So, are you all here? All right. So, I found this video. Sorry, I teach class those days. Well, I have to have 
flower window open every other Sunday around 6 a.m. Does that work? Is Joe available on any of those dates? Because if he is, I am definitely not. <laughs> Hold on. Let me just move a few of these committee meetings. Yep, that could work. Fine, fine. I suppose that date works. Okay, I think we have it. We have a date. Can you confirm? Yes. I'm out of it to my calendar now. It's on my calendar. I won't forget. <laughs> my first thesis defense. I'm like a real professor. <laughs> yeah, yes, fine. Wait, hold on. I totally forgot. Can we reschedule? I had an all-day faculty senate meeting that day. Uh, let me see. It looks like the only available time for you all to meet is... Yes? Next week.
So that individual may or may not, more than likely, may not be a person from your department. And this person is not going to be a spectator. Okay? So this person is not going to be the, the non-opinion, as you saw in the video. Right? And for uh, Dr. Mathis Lawson, he was the, the methodologist of just wonderful. Her, her study, and she'll talk a little bit more, but her fifth person who was appointed by the graduate college really enhanced her study in a way that us as our, her committee members, we just didn't have the expertise to do. So we were really appreciative that he was appointed by the graduate college. Um, and so, you know, don't get offended if you have someone and, you know, you can't say, well, they're outside of my discipline. They don't understand engineering. Well, they understand research. Right, if there are tenure track faculty here at North Carolina A&T State University, they are supposed to understand research. And so you want to make sure that you um, approach them and, and welcome them and make them feel inclusive to this process and a part of your team. Okay? Yeah, I just want to clarify one thing <clears throat> in case anyone's confused. The form that they're speaking about is submitted by all thesis and dissertation students. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a way for us to be sure that the members of your committee have been chosen appropriately. The graduate faculty representative only applies to the PhD. Right. So just to make sure you're clear, if you're a thesis student, an external or a, a, an additional member will not be appointed <coughs> to the committee by the graduate college. If you're a PhD student, it will. So again, that, that last piece about the graduate faculty representative only applies to PhD level students. And uh, one other point that I want to place emphasis on before we move, your chairperson of your thesis or your dissertation must come from your department, right? And you can have co-chairs, okay? I've served on a lot of uh, committees as a co-chair, um, but the, your, your co-chair and or your chair has to come from within your department. Okay, not your college, not your discipline, but your academic department. Yes? So how about it, how, what's the latest for that, and what I've been seeing for some reason you change the topic? You can change your committee. No, the topic. But, okay, so that, we didn't yeah. talk about that. Okay. Oh, you're, I'll just go ahead. <laughs> okay, so your committee, don't just get someone on your committee because they're your favorite professor or you've had an awesome time in their class or you've been their GA because guess what, they may have n nothing to do with your topic. They may not understand your methodology. You can come on in. Um, they may just not be the most appropriate person for your study and to support you in that magnitude. Okay. So if your topic changes, you go back to your chair and you have a conversation. It is a two-way conversation. It is not all about who your chair wants on your committee. You as a student, this is your study, right? I know that there's a lot of pressure and you feel that there are power dynamics, but at the end of the day, it's your name on your study. Not your, yeah, your committee members are on your, your study as well, but your, this is your thesis. This is your dissertation. So you do want to have a conversation, and it should be a mutual agreement. Now, sometimes you might not win. I will just say it. Because you have to realize and, and understand and appreciate the wisdom that your committee members as well as your chair has. And like the adversary, you may not understand some of the political nuances that go on that may have a negative influence on your committee and on your process. So always yield to your chair, but you should be comfortable enough with your thesis or your dissertation chair that you can have that conversation and say, you know, now that my topic has changed, I would like for us to consider such and such because his or her interests focus on this or they have expertise in this particular methodology or they really understand this particular theoretical or conceptual framework or they have models and they have a patent with this particular design approach, right? So you want to be able to have that conversation with your chairperson, okay? So, yeah, but I'm saying, do you, do you resubmit? Yes, you have to resubmit the form because it's, think of it as a, again, quality assurance. This is a checks and balances. This helps the, the people in the graduate college know that you're not just getting someone 
around campus because again, every person on your committee has to be approved. They have to be approved as graduate level faculty. And that's a graduate college uh, measure of control that they institute to make sure everyone across campus is following a standard procedure, okay? So anytime that you have changes, yes, that form has to be resubmitted. And sometimes it, like I tell my adult learners all the time, life happens. And sometimes life might happen with one of your committee members where for whatever reason, they can no longer provide you with that service and the expertise that they need to, so then you have to have a switch. So it's not just about your topic. It could be a multitude or variety of reasons, but at the end of the day, the committee form that the graduate school has to have should match your title page of your final thesis or your dissertation. And I'll say this, at the point that I was here, at the point that I um, selected my committee, when I, so, when I went to have my conversation to ask for, you, for them to be on the committee, I had my chapters <coughs> one, two, and three written. So I didn't go to them with, oh, an idea. Um, and, I, and, and when I first started, that's what I was doing. I had all these ideas and I was kind of working it out in my head. I had a chair who, I, who was helping me get a good question, who helped me get on the right track. We were really trying to solidify a good researchable topic. I had a lot of ideas and all ideas don't make good research studies. And so once I got what I felt like was a good research study and I had questions, I had, you know, a frame, I had my questions, I had my theoretical framework, I had a, how I wanted to conduct the study. Then I went to person number two, one, two, and three and said, this is the study that I want to conduct. So at that point, for me, it was no turning around. It wasn't a switch another topic. It was, I'm, I'm rolling and I need some help. This is where I'm going. Because if you, what I found, if you go in very early and you're not sure, you're going to get a lot of opinions and go this way and go that way because everybody's an expert in their thing but you got to be solid in your thing as well and say this is what I'm looking at help me make it better help me make it better help me make this get through but if you go in just kind of that's what you're to me that's what classes are for work that out during your coursework and then by the time you get here kind of have something solid and ready to go and work with your chair okay so you shouldn't be going to all of these different people saying, hey, oh, I have this idea, oh, I have this idea, and you're, uh, you haven't really finalized this with your chairperson for your committee. Um, before we address your question, is there an Yvette here, Yvette Robbins? I have a present for you. And you want to thank that woman right there? You dropped your card. Oh, thank you. Oh, I didn't Oh. I you have a question? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry? What do we give the form to? The graduate college. So you want to talk yeah, about what when I gave my When I took my form to the graduate college, I kept a copy. Whenever you take it to the graduate co college, they will log it in. Log it yourself the day and the time that I turn it in and keep it as a part of your portfolio and as of all the paperwork that you have. Um, during the time that I submitted mine, um, I, did, I got a late assignment of person number five, but I also had my documentation of when I turned it in. And so it was like, well, I have to keep going, but I don't have my person number five, but I turned it in at a certain amount of time. But keeping up with that documentation and knowing when I did it, who I gave it to, and what, even what time. Because then I could go back and say, well, you logged it in at 11.55 on this day. And that's a part of us is what we do as researchers. We document. Okay. So now, was there another question? So now it's time to write. We have an idea, a researchable topic, I should say that. We have a researchable topic, and now we're, it's time to begin to actually put pen on paper more. So this is the order of how I feel as though I wrote and how I would advise someone to write their dissertation. It starts with chapter one-ish. It goes into chapter two. It goes back to one then to three, four, back to two, and then to five. And I know you think you're going to write it in this linear one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to write this chapter, then go to this chapter, then go to this chapter, then go to this chapter. And it's this linear process. No. You remember the first video, the first visual, and it was all like this? This document, when you first start, chapters one, two, and three are the proposal. A frame of that, a version of that, is going to be your proposal. 
So you have those first three chapters written up. All right? And when I say you start with one, because you have a, 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 a question, you have a topic, you start going into the lit in chapter two. And you know, if you, how many of you heard a thousand times? It has to be grounded in the literature. Yes. This is what they're talking about. You have an idea, but what does the literature say? There should be something out there to support this thing. You just should, you, at this point, you're just not making stuff up. There should be something to back up or to support what you're going um, to study. Once you get into two, and you've read all of these articles, you've defined your strands, you've got all these articles, one starts to make a little more sense. Because now I can go back to one and really make it solid. Does that make sense? Because you really, at this point, may not have been as deep and steep in the literature as you think you have been. But once you start writing two, it gets deeper. And then you start reading implement, implement, implications for future study. And you start reading results, and it's like, ah, oh, this thing starts to make sense. So I go back, and I beef up num um, questions, chapter number one. Mm -hmm. You going to say something? Um, the only other additional... Um kind of point that you might come back to, and this is for quantitative, qualitative, and especially for mixed methods, right? Your chapter three, so after you work on your chapter four, just like you have to go back to your chapter two, I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about why you go back to chapter two, but you're also going to have to go back to chapter three, because after you've collected your data and you've analyzed your data, some things that you presented in your proposal may be a little different. Because you may have had to run a different ex experiment. You may have had to do a different type of data collection approach. Like instead of you, you might have wanted to do a, a focus group, right? In, in addition to interviews. But for whatever reasons, you could not convene your participants to conduct a focus group. So you had to do multiple individual interviews. So you might want to have to go back and change to make sure that your chapter three accurately reflects what you have done in the conduction of your, your study. Okay. One of the biggest pieces of advice that um, one of, it wasn't one of my, it wasn't even a committee member, but someone in my department told me, um, in, the, in the beginning when you write chapters one, two, and three, most people think that's my proposal. And one, two, and three is a proposal. I get approved, and then I go and do the study, get my results, and then I add chapters four and five to one, two, and three. No. One, two, and three are what you are proposing to study. Once you conduct the study and you write it up, the whole document becomes a dissertation, which means the verbiage has to change from present tense or to from future tense, what you're going to do to what you did. The whole document has to stick, um, pull together. So in the example that we talked about earlier with fifth member, so at the time that I did my study and I had one, two, and three, I conducted the research, I got no results. Which is, you know, for me, heartbreaking because you want to find something. You spent all this time. And my number five, committee member number five, who was an astute quantitative researcher, said, There's no way, Sharita, that you had 1,000 data points and you found nothing. Something isn't right. And I bet it's in chapter three. Well, you remember, at this point, I'm already in four. And he said, Back up to three. We re-ran the whole, took my data set, re-ran it, doing a, doing a different analysis, and guess who got results? Wow. And then the results, did I talk about it in two? Because I didn't know I was going to get those results. So I had to go back to two and find in the literature, but why did that happen? What is the reason? So then I had to go back to two to add into the lit review, the review of the literature, what I found in four. Does that make sense to everybody? Why it's one document. So in your mind, which I did, I separated one, two, and three as a proposal, then do it, and then add four and five. One, two, three, four, and five is the dissertation. And even though we're saying dissertation, Our this thesis. also is applicable to your thesis. Your thesis has chapters one, two, three, four, and five. And then also, depending upon your methodology, you may have more than five chapters. <coughs> okay? That's not unusual, um, particularly in qualitative and or definitely mixed methods. Because in mixed methods, you should have a, an additional chapter because you'll have a quantitative findings chapter and then a qualitative findings chapter. Okay? You had a question? I did. So just to be clear, 
that after you run uh, your study and chapter two changes, is that does that alter your proposal? Or does the that proposal, just, is proposal is over. Is done. Oh, done. that's what I'm saying. So right. you don't have to go back. No, because you phase. proposed to you propose that I want to go study this. At right. this point, you don't know what was going to happen. Okay. Or if anything was going to happen. Right. You okay. just propose to go take a look because based on the literature, right. there's okay. a hole or there's something that you right. think is there. Mm -hmm. And so you look for it and then it's like, huh, something happened. If it does, maybe not. Who knows? Right. So it's just a, it's just a more clarity then mm -hmm. in your chapter two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're going to we're gonna break down each chapter in okay. the next uh, couple of slides. So for your chapter one, right, this is probably your most powerful chapter. Because you need to come out with a bang, right? This chapter should be that anyone who is inside, outside of your discipline, uh, lay person, at, who can read at a ninth grade level, should be able to understand what you're about to, uh, what the study's about, right? This is your intro, the entree, okay? So all of these points, these bullet points, they have to be very concise and clear. You have to present your case of why this study was so significant because there was a problem that you identified in the literature and then you're going to use a particular conceptual framework, theoretical framework, a very um, specific design approach, a certain instrumentation, a certain laboratory procedure. You're going to use that to identify and answer a research question or, a, or to um, address a hypothesis, okay? You have to define your definition of terms. Again, someone who is outside of your field should be able to pick up this document and follow your study. Someone should be able to read your study and if they have the expertise or not, find somebody who has the expertise, they should be able to, to attempt to replicate your study. And so you have to define certain terms for them that may not be familiar to someone in outside of your discipline, right? And then there may be terms that you define that are very specific to your study that may be defined <laughs> elsewhere a little differently, okay? Um, and lastly, you have to talk about the limitations, delimitations to your, to your study. For you all, you're not trying to tackle all of the problems and all of the gaps in the literature in the whole wide world, right? And so you are looking at a very specific problem. So within that, you have limited the um, trajectory of exploration. You haven't limited your study, but you have limited the trajectory of exploration for this study. So that later on, once you become doctor so-and-so, or you complete your master's thesis, you can go on and you can look at other studies that are related to your um, thesis or your dissertation, but were outside of the scope because you set those boundaries for your study. So that's the delimitations and limitations. So I know that when you see the word limitations, you think there's a lack of, but look at it and think of it as this is the boundary that you have set around your study, and you have done that intentionally. Okay? You limited it. You put limitations for, to control it for a reason. You have a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, as far as the definition, is it okay to generalize and then do a glossary later on? or You do like No, you do a, you actually have, this is called a definition of terms. So, and, and this is another thing. After this um, workshop, I encourage you all to go and look at the thesis and the dissertations that have been um, conducted and published here at North Carolina a &T. That gives you the best insight. Look at who, you know, ask your, your chairperson of your, your committee or who you're thinking of asking to be your chair. Ask to look at some of their, their thesis and dissertations that they have um, chaired their committees. That gives you insight, number one, of the format and the kind of the flavor that they would like for you to do. It also lets you understand the flavor of your discipline, the flavor of your department, okay? Um, and so you, you, you will have a section that is, it is titled Definition of Terms, and depending upon your study, right, you will use literature to support it. So, for example, um, in qualitative research, when it comes to race, ethnicity, you want to define what do you mean by black? Because for black, that might be different than African American, and it might be different than people of color, or what have you, right? If you're doing certain um, uh, laboratory procedures, 
and you have a very unique approach to something, you have to define that. For example, this scientist, such and such, and you put the citation, um, describes this technique as da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And you include the citation in your definition of terms, and then you put that reference in the, at the end for your reference list. <coughs> and if you want to coin a term yourself, that's where you define it. I define this for this study as such and such. So then later, guess what? Someone's going to cite you. Mm -hmm. okay. in, in my study, one of my variables was student success. What, if someone tell me, what does student success mean to you? Anyone. If a student is successful, they did what? Graduated? Straight A's. Straight A's. Got a job. Got a job. So we all have defined success in three different ways. For the purpose of my study, a student success means a student had a 2.8 GPA because my population was being admitted into a program that required a 2.8. So that was success. So my def definition of term says student success equals 2.8 GPA. Although it can mean many things. Mm -hmm. Also, I saw you all writing notes. For statement of the problem, this stood in my this stuck in my head the entire time I wrote mine. Doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom. This just is bad. This is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. It's a problem, and I need to study it. This is a problem. The world's gonna end if I don't tell you why. The statistics say this, we're all just gonna fuck. This is bad, this is bad, this is bad. That's the statement of the stats, whatever, to, to plead your case. Mm -hmm. Dr. Richardson, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. future Dr. Right, Richardson. But um, how do you differentiate between putting the problem statement and the purpose of the study? Uh -huh. So, your problem statement is, so what is the gap? How have you illuminated the gap in the literature? What's missing? What do we further, you know, need to explore? And once you, you build that case, your thesis, Right? That is your thesis, why you're doing this. The purpose of this study is to explore, is to investigate, is to address that gap. So they should be very complementary. Right? They should, that should be a, a very well-explained union. And typically, your purpose statement your, or your purpose of the study is one sentence. Say it again. Your purpose of the study is one sentence. Wow. Your statement problem is longer because that's where you present and build your case. But your purpose of the study should you should be able to say it in one sentence. Going back to my study, forty something percent of students don't graduate. So many percent don't get jobs. This doesn't happen. HBCU students underperform. They don't get teaching license. They don't do this. But the purpose of this study is to explore how these two things relate to solve that, to help with this problem. That's it. <clears throat> the statement problem is the argument. Yes, you, the case. Don't think about it as an argument okay. because you may be trying to explore and to um, confirm something in the literature. Okay. But you're using a different technique. Right? So, and that's why I would think of it as a gap. There's something that you can add to the literature by doing this study, by exploring it this way. Um, oftentimes, it is something that is missing, that has been underexplored, understudied. People haven't thought of it. Or there's a new technique and you want to see if you yield the same results using this technique. Okay? So don't think of it as an argument. Mm -hmm. Think of it as you are building a case to support your reason and rationale for uh, uh, conducting this study this way. Yes. Yeah, can we get a copy of the slides? Yes. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right, so moving on to chapter two. That makes us feel good. Yeah. <laughs> the, the glorious question, is it grounded in the literature? What does that mean? Um, and this is uh, the pieces of the literature review. First and foremost, making sure that you're um, pieces of literature are current. When I did my study and I was going into the um, either ProQuest or Eric, whatever I was using, I would always start at three years. I looked for anything that came out in the last three, then I opened it up to five, then I opened it up to seven, and I opened it up to ten, and then I just opened it up unlimited because sometimes it's just something no one has done anything with. you got to go all the way back. But trying to come recent and then opening and going back. Valid resources, although we like um, you know, Time Magazine and 
some of those things, those are not for our profession necessarily considered valid when looking for peer reviewed articles. But for who's my natural science person? Someone said, so Time Magazine may be, because Time is associated with Nat National Geographic, right? So make sure that you understand what is considered a scholarly or valid or gold standard resource for your discipline, okay? And I just want to kind of get a, a, a check. Raise your hand if you know who your re reference librarian is here at North Carolina A&T State University. Raise your hand high. Okay, word of advice. As graduate students, you need to find out who your reference librarian is that is uh, has been assigned to your academic <clears throat> unit. They are here to help you. And they are awesome. They are good. They're here. They, they oftentimes will meet with you outside of whatever hours are typical 8 to 5 because they recognize and understand that you're graduate students. But that's your responsibility to make sure that you know and can identify the resources that are here available to you. Let me tell you something. Newsflash, guess what? You pay a hefty fee every semester for these resources. So you need to know how to use them, how to access them, because it will make this process so much easier. Okay? So after you leave today, I want y'all to flood the library and tell them that you went to this great presentation and you must find out who your reference librarian is. Okay? And also, the beautiful thing about living in Greensboro, we are surrounded by numerous other colleges that also have libraries. So if there's not a resource here, there's UNCG, there's other schools in this area that you may have to do a little legwork and travel and go over there and pick up something that you need. Or, because we're part of a UNC system, you do have access to other libraries within the system, such as UNC Charlotte, NC State, um, UNC Pembroke. So if you're visiting Charlotte and you're you know, just down there for a day and you're not that far from the campus, just show them your Aggie um, One card and you should be able to go in and utilize their services just like anyone else. Now, I don't know about the book checking out process, but you will have access to it because you are a system student. So annotations from the first, if, if you are secure and solid and know kind of the area that you want to research, hopefully in the very beginning of your um, journey, you'll start reading literature. Uh, I would advise you to go ahead and start writing annotations and those <coughs> in a way that's orderly that you can get back to. May, um, also in chapter two, two, the relevance of the literature. How is this relevant? What does this have to do with anything that I'm talking about? It's a great article. How does it connect? Um, with what I'm talking about is also an important part, not just summarizing the article, but also making it relevant to your study. Mm -hmm. um, analysis and synthesis within strands, this is organizing them into your topic areas by your variable, by your t all your articles that may be dealing with the participant or the location or whatever that is. Those are your research strands. Uh, I, had every, I had a strand for every single variable that I had. And then your summary is a synthesis of the literature across the strands. It's where you synthesize it and you bring them all together. All of these talk about this, all of these talk about this, close it out, and then they all fit together in the end in this way. So they're not just random articles. All right, chapter three, my favorite chapter. I am a methodologist at heart. Quantitative, qual, mixed method, I love it all, okay? So think of this as this is your recipe. How many of you all like to cook? How many of you all like? How many of you all like to eat? <laughs> okay, if you don't like to cook, you like to eat. It's one of the others. Some of y'all like to drink too, but you know, you know, I'm not going to go there with the mixology. But this is your recipe. Okay, this is your recipe so that you can tell anyone and everyone this is what procedures, the steps I took to execute this study. And this is why I took this approach, okay? All of you all will have a, a very different approach. Just because it's qualitative, there are different strands of qualitative research. Just because you're doing a, an experiment, there are different approaches to experiments, right? Quasi-experimental, Delphi studies. There are so many different methodol methodological approaches, strategies, te techniques, and you want to make sure that you clearly explain that, okay? 
For qualitative researchers, the role of the researcher is critical because you may be looking and, and exploring a topic that is very near and dear for you, to you. So, for example, our um, colleagues here in leadership studies, right? They're already leaders. They may be in a leadership role in their profession or in their area. And they want to further explore other leaders that are similar to that or that are in a different context. So they have to be up front and explain their role as a researcher. They have to acknowledge their biases. They have to acknowledge their assumptions. Right? So this is similar to the hypothesis. So you predict that X is going to happen. And you predict that based on... Perhaps you've already done an experiment like this, or you've worked in industry, and you have seen this, or you have done research with this particular professor or researcher, and you have um, participated in a similar uh, uh, experiment with a different uh, microorganism or different chemical composition, <coughs> what have you. So you have an hypothesis, you have an idea or an assumption about what results you are to expect. So you have to put that up front. Um, you have to explain your sample, your participants, and you have to give very good detail about the context of your study, about your participant, your sample, your pool, what have you. Instrumentation, right? You have to explain why you're using such in instrumentation, and this includes SPSS. It includes any other data analysis software that you use, whether it's qualitative, quantitative, um, laboratory, Chemical analysis, um, micro, uh, microscopy, what have you. You have to explain all of that. Then after you've collected your data and you've analyzed, you have to explain step by step what did you do to analyze your data. Okay? And lastly, this is very, 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 very important. What makes your results trustworthy or valid or legitimate? So trustworthiness is qualitative research. Validity, reliability, quantitative. Legitimate, mixed methods. In other words, you have to share that you conducted this study in the most ethical manner. This is why. These are the measures of control. Your quality assurance, your quality control. What did you do? Did you do QC on your instrumentation? How often did you do it? How? What, where did you, um, your data points, how far were they within the standard deviation? Right? One, two, three. Did you have any outliers? What did you do with those? Are they included in your results? So this is where you really present and explain to your readers that you did this study with due process and it is just and it is sound. So with this, would you also put like, um, like when you actually go out and talk to like different people about like different topics and fields that are covered in what you're trying to study is this also what you put in this section um so are you are you talking to them before you conduct the study or after before so before you would talk to them if you so this would be uh considered perhaps a pilot study right so pilot you just study. want to speak to people to kind of get a feel of you know um you can do a survey. Say you want to send a survey out to individuals to kind of say, do you think that this would be a topic worth exploring, or what has your experience been? Now, first you would have to get IRB approval mm -hmm. for a pilot study. You would do this before. But if you're just having general conversations with people in the field just to kind of um, explore if this is a <coughs> topic or if this is something of interest, you don't have to get IRB approval for that. That's just casual conversation. So you would not include that because that's not considered um, data. Okay. That's information for you. That's no different than you reading the literature. That's no different than you reading an article um, that says the, the top 10 most uh, hot topics in this field. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, that's coffee conversation. Okay. But if you want to do a pilot study, to really inform your study before you develop your proposal, before you conduct your full study, you will need IRB approval, IBC, IECO, <coughs> what have you. You have to go through certain procedures because then a pilot study is still considered a research study. Does everyone understand that? Because that's very, very, very important. And if you have any questions about that process, I encourage you all 
ask before you do. <laughs> okay? We will never get tired of answering emails. Ask your chairperson, ask your department chair, ask your dean, ask the graduate college, ask so many people because it's good to be proactive as opposed to reactive. Because <coughs> reactive measures also perhaps can have consequential measures that may not be beneficial. Okay? So chat. Sorry, Sean, I'm going back to committee. I know whatever you have, chief committee, you need to be in the department. So the title of the, my chair is, should be in my line. I mean, if he's a full professor, part time, Jason. Okay, so the graduate college, that's again, that document, the graduate catalog, clearly defines that. In order for you, and I'll, correct me if I'm um, inaccurate, Dr. Bisbee, <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, your chairperson and or co-chair, one of them has to be a tenured, full member of the graduate faculty. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So a part-time professor, that may not be applicable. An assistant professor, right, the one that you saw in the video, she perhaps could not serve as a solo chair for a thesis or dissertation committee but she could serve as a co-chair. That's where I am right now. I serve as a multiple co-chair. I'm actually, uh, well, by the time she gets there, hopefully I'll have two here, then I'll be her solo chair, but for right now, I am her co-chair, okay? Um, so you wanna make sure that you read that document. That is the law of the land, and it is applicable for all programs, okay? So chapters, we're going to have to speed up because I know we're yeah. running out of time, but chapters 1, 2, and 3, 1, 2, and 3 are complete. You're now going before the committee to propose that this is a study that you would like to conduct. Um, again, this is getting all five of them together for the first time, and then you go before them. You're getting there. You have your deposal defense. They say, yay, this looks good. Just tweak a little bit over here. Change a little bit of that. I think this might be causing you some problems. If you have to make revisions, you send it back, so on and so forth. You receive the stamp of approval. They sign off on some documentation, submit it, and now you're ready to go. You then will go into the IRB process if needed. Um, or IBC or IACUC. Depends upon your study and what all that entails. Okay. You then go out, collect your data, spend some time, whatever <coughs> method that you propose in Chapter 3, you actually conduct it. After that, you have all of the information. You've um, analyzed it. You've done your data analysis. When you report it, what does it say? This is not your opinion. This is just what you found. Even if you don't like what you found, even if you found nothing, this is where you report it. Okay, if you're doing, well, I'll let you talk about qualitative, how that looks. So qualitative, again, I, it, whichever design or methodological approach you um, are thinking of, I encourage you to review a thesis and or dissertation that has that same methodology so that you can see how it is formatted. And I, I would encourage you to not just look here at North Carolina a t Look at other institutions, right? Because the dissertation, regardless of your institution, should be pretty consistent. There are some innovations, though, and if your chair can, you know, is, is comfortable with that, I've seen some very interesting presentations of your results, presentations of findings. But whatever it is, you report exactly what was found. It's not time for your interpretation. Your interpretation will come next in chapter, in chapter five. five. So this is where you say, <coughs> okay, this was the problem. This is what the literature said in chapter two. Here was my recipe to conduct this study. This is what I found, and so now my chapter five is my interpretation of my results as it's juxtaposed to the literature. Did it add to it? Was it consistent? Did you discover something new? Did you identify a new theoretical or conceptual framework? Did you identify a flaw in the design of an instrument or a flaw in the design of a laboratory procedure? Did you discover that there is an additional measure that needs to occur for this particular instrument or what have you, okay? Did you discover a new um, technique that's going to be uh, more powerful for preventing cancer cells from multiplying, whatever, right? 
you have to explain that and you have to juxtapose to the literature. The other big piece, implications for practice. So now that you found it, the big so what? The so what? This is the so what? How does your study inform practice, leadership, policy, theory, design? Okay? Patents. And then your recommendations for future research. So there are some things that, you know, had I known then, hindsight is twenty twenty. So if you could do this study all over again, is there anything that you would do differently? Is there anything that you would like to do in the future? If you had different resources, if you had a different amount of time, if you had a team versus just you and your committee, if you had industry support, okay, right? Um, and then conclusion. So what did you gain out of it? And I know some people are like, oh, well, you write the dissertation in third person. But this is your study. You cannot tell me that after all this hard work or your thesis, blood, sweat, tears, and coffee, that you did not gain something from this. And it's okay to have that conclusion. You earn the right to conclude and say, you know what, this is what I've gained from it. Okay? And if you don't want to call it your conclusion, because your conclusion should really consist of your conclusion to the overall study, you can have an additional section called your final thoughts, researchers' reflections, or what have you. Okay? That's it. <laughs> Okay. 
because we don't want to have to say cease and desist until we can clarify some things with your study because we will. Okay? And it's really to protect you. It's a, it's a layer of protection. So please utilize us as a resource. And at the end of the day, listen to your chair. I can't, I can't stress that enough. Listen to your chair. <laughs>